Hello, my name is Christian Wagesbeck. I'm curator of 20th century art here at the New Mexico Museum of Art, and I'm the in-house curator for For America. For America is broken up into five sections that trace the history of American painting from the founding of the Academy to contemporary work. The first section, Founding an American School, looks at some of the earliest groups of artists working in the United States. This new Academy was important for American artists because it offered a place for them to exhibit their work and get in the public eye. It was also fertile ground for artists to come together and found many of the United States' first schools of painting. One of these was the Hudson River School. Albert Bierstadt was a member of the second generation of the Hudson River School. These painters were known for their iconic and dramatic depictions of the American wilderness, and particularly the West. This painting by Bierstadt, titled On the Sweetwater, Near Devil's Gate, depicts an iconic natural landform in Wyoming. In the 19th century, Bierstadt was invited to join an expeditionary group west to find a shorter route along the Oregon Trail. On this trip, he painted and sketched extensively, and this painting is a result of the work that he made there. It depicts an iconic landform in Wyoming called Devil's Gate. Bierstadt, like other members of the Hudson River School, focused on making pictures of the American West and the American wilderness that focused on the drama of the landscape one of the interesting things about this exhibition is that many of the historic works are commented upon by contemporary artists who are also members of the Academy. Indigenous artist Juan Quick to see Smith points out the inconsistency in Bierstadt's work. While his depictions of the American West are empty of human presence, the land that he's painting were inhabited by her ancestors who were forcibly removed from this setting. In this instance, we've got contemporary voices re-looking at past depictions of our American history to give a fuller picture of the American story. The second section of For America is titled A New Internationalism, and it looks at artists working in the United States and in Europe during the Golden Age. One such artist is John Singer Sargent, shown here in his self-portrait, and here in his portrait of Impressionist master Claude Monet. John Singer Sargent is the quintessential international artist at the turn of the century. Born in Florence, Italy, to American parents, he studied all over Europe in his youth and was fluent in English, Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Sargent's career flourished in Paris, where he was best known for his sumptuous portraits of the Parisian elite. These commissions won him renowned in both the social circles of France and as a member of the artistic elite. Though Sargent's fame came from painting the elites of Paris, his passion was for painting his own social circle, including artists. With these figures, who were his friends and close confidants, he was able to depict them without needing to flatter, and we get a much deeper and more contemplative sense of his subjects, as we do here with this portrait of Claude Monet. Monet was a subject that Sargent painted several times, both in indoor close-up paintings like the one we have here, but also following the artist into the field, depicting him painting on plein air, and showing his appreciation for evolving Impressionist trends of the day. Despite his renown as a portraitist, Sargent painted very few images of himself. In fact, there are only two self-portraits known to exist of the artists, this being one of them. In this second section, A New Internationalism, we see American artists breaking out onto an international scene and becoming celebrities like John Singer Sargent. The third section of For America is titled Painting America. And with this selection of artists, we see the scope of national academicians expanding from the art centers of the East to the arts colonies of the West, including places like Taos. This painting is by Robert Henry. Henry was an artist, a teacher, and a provocateur, and it depicts his student George Bellows. Henry and Bellows traveled around the nation together, depicting different regions of the country, including New Mexico. Henry was an important founding figure for the New Mexico Museum of Art. In 1917, in San Diego, he met our museum's founding director, Edgar Lee Hewitt, and convinced him that New Mexico, as a new state, needed an art museum to be taken seriously as a national center. Henry was also responsible for introducing some of the groundbreaking curatorial and collection ideas that were the foundation of the New Mexico Museum of Arts exhibitions programs and our collection. In the early part of the 20th century, Henry came to New Mexico to paint the indigenous cultures of the region and also to be part of the founding of the new museum that he had instigated at Greeley Hewitt to construct. During this time, he reached out to many of his former students, including Bellows, and invited them to come and join him here in New Mexico. Across from this portrait in the exhibition, we have Bellows' representation of Chimayo, New Mexico. 
showing his interest in indigenous regional cultures as he traveled across the country. Painting America features to the United States in an expanded scope, featuring the everyday life of places as far flung as New York City or Taos, New Mexico, but focusing on regional American identities. Robert Henry was one of the most influential figures in American painting. Not only acting as a teacher and a provocateur, he was interested in expanding the definition of what American art was, focusing not only on the everyday lives of American citizens, but also coming west and looking at the indigenous cultures of America as just as important as what was going on in our metropolitan centers. This painting by Mae Stevens, Benny Andrews, the artist, and Big Daddy Paper Doll is indicative of the kind of social and political concerns that become relevant in the fourth section of For America, post-war realism. This section looks at artists who are working after World War II and engaging with the social and political concerns of the day, ranging from topics of domestic violence, racism, war, and class inequality. These are all themes that have defined Mae Stevens' career, both personally and as an artist. Post-war realism works with the kind of artists who are working in the latter half of the 20th century, who are dealing with realistic subject matter, both in terms of representing the figure and in terms of engaging with the social concerns of the day. This is in stark contrast to major artistic trends that are going on at the same time that promote large-scale abstraction. The National Academy during the later half of the 20th century represented a strong and important alternative artistic discourse to the kind of abstraction that dominated the New York and LA art scenes at the time. And Mae Stevens was a part of this. Engaging in realistic artwork allowed her to express the social and political concerns that dominated her work. In this painting, we see the artist and her good friend Benny Andrews in the foreground. Benny Andrews worked with the artist's husband in Attica prison during the Vietnam War to bring social services to the prisoners who were there at the time. The naturalistic figure of the artist and Benny Andrews in the foreground are in stark contrast to the flat, almost abstracted figures of a police uniform and a military uniform that loom over them larger than life in the background. These almost abstracted uniform figures come from a series that Mae Stephen did that looked at paper doll style cutouts of the uniforms of authority, including not only the police and the military, but more metaphorical figures such as the hangman. In post-war realism, we see artists shifting their perspectives from questions of what constitutes American art to issues of what parts of American identity should we be focusing on in our artwork and how can we include social, cultural, and racial issues in this dialogue. It's not only promoting American art on its own terms, but also asking the question, American art for who? The final section of For America represents the work of contemporary painters whose work looks back to their historical forerunners while also keeping up to date with the most contemporary concerns in the art world. This work is a self-portrait by contemporary painter Peter Saul. Saul's work is defined by his exuberant, bombastic, and irreverent approach to his subject matter. In this instance, this irreverence extends to the artist himself, as he's depicting his own likeness in the most unflattering way possible. Here we see the artist with glasses askew, a maddened look in his eyes, as potato-like teeth erupt from bleeding gums. The neon colors of his palette are designed to clash in an exquisite way that catches the viewer's eye as they walk through the gallery and makes Saul's work dominate any space that they're hung in. Saul approaches his work from the point of view of a jokester, though he often depicts serious, heavy subject matter such as war and man's inhumanity to man in his own works. He takes some of the most grotesque aspects of human culture and makes them almost comical through his playful use of line, the way that he deforms his figures, and the fun use of color. Though the National Academy of Design was America's first serious art institution, Saul refuses to take himself or his role as an academician too seriously. Here, we see him looking back at generations of portrait painters and placing himself among them, but not allowing himself to become too heavy.